Welcome to Birth Words. This is episode number 62. And in this episode, I'm going to be chatting with Dr. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, author of A Midwife's Tale. Welcome to Birth Words. Words are powerful. What are you doing with yours? In this podcast, birth doula and applied linguistics scholar Sarah Pixton invites you to be intentional, reflective, and empowering with your language as we come together to honor those who give birth. The work of Birth Words is to elevate the language surrounding pregnancy, birth, and the postpartum period. Nothing in this podcast should be taken as medical advice. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich is a professor emerita at Harvard University. She's probably best known for A Midwife's Tale, The Life of Martha Ballard, based on her diary, 1785 to 1812, which won the Pulitzer Prize for History and many other awards in 1991. Others know her for a sentence that escaped from one of her scholarly articles to become a popular slogan. She explored that phenomenon in Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History, written in 2007. Professor Ulrich has received numerous awards for teaching, scholarship, and public service. She is past president of the American Historical Association and an elected member of the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She continues to write, lecture, and consult with museums and historical societies nationwide. In today's podcast episode, I'll be talking with Dr. Ulrich about her Pulitzer Prize winning book, A Midwife's Tale. I highly recommend any of you listening who haven't already read this book to go find a copy, check it out from your local library after you wait in line for a while, most likely. Um, Listen to it. It is a fabulous book that gives a really interesting historical perspective of the practice of midwifery and also the role of women and just what life was like generally in the late 1700s and early 1800s. For the purpose of this episode, to give you some context, I want to give you a brief summary of the book before we jump into the interview with Laurel. So A Midwife's Tale is based on the diary of Martha Ballard, who was a midwife in 18th century Maine. And the book goes through her diary and connects all of the dots that are missing as you read a rather taciturn, as Laurel calls it, diary of a midwife who was a busy woman who made notes of her daily activities in her diary in the late 1700s and early 1800s. These little snippets from her diary give insights into the medical practices and household practices, the religion, and the sexual mores of New England at this time period. And Laurel does an excellent job of drawing together all of the pieces that are represented in this diary. So from 1785 to 1812, Martha Ballard kept a diary that recorded her work. She, in those 27 years, attended 816 births, and she also records her domestic life, her interactions with her children and other family members, and the work that she does with her home. Um, And based on this diary, Laurel gives us a beautiful portrait of this hardworking woman and a little snapshot into this period of time in history. So I invite you now to meet with Dr. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Welcome, Laurel, to the Birth Words podcast. Oh, I'm happy to be here. I am so excited to talk to you about your expertise in your studies of a midwife's tale and just your overall knowledge as a historian of American history. Oh, I'm, I was once identified on a poster as a midwife, (laughs) which was very, very funny. (laughs) I am a historian and um, I love to write about things that I couldn't do myself. So, (laughs) Perfect. Well, we'll clearly identify you as a historian for this one, so nobody calls you to catch their babies. Okay. (laughs) 
So I just have some questions to ask you to kind of guide our conversations. Um, and I'm interested in any other insights that come up as we chat. Okay. My first question is, when you first dove into Martha Ballard's diary, what was most striking to you about the way that she wrote about her work as a midwife? Well, it was very, very frustrating. Oh. Um, I didn't initially choose this project because she was a midwife. I chose this project because she kept a diary, mm -hmm. which was very, very rare for women of her generation. Um, there are a few records, just birth records, left by midwives from the 1700s. But, you know, this diary begins in 1785, and I think it is the earliest really detailed daily diary kept by a woman who was a healer and a midwife. So. I was just fascinated with everything about her. And I thought I understood quite a lot about childbirth in early America because I had written, um, I'd written earlier books. I'd read um, treatises from the period. I had read secondary accounts. And so... Midwifery wasn't the initial thing that led me into the diary. I was interested in housework. I was interested in spinning and weaving. I was very interested in trade, interested in her um, records of controversies of all kinds, and mainly just interested in anything she could tell me about life in that period of time. But I knew that childbirth was at the center of much of her work, and that it was important and that it mattered. But what I got from the diary initially were just lists of names. Mm -hmm. uh, and and often mentioning the father, you know, uh, Mr. Denmore's son uh, and the date. Mm -hmm. um, if you've read the book and if you've looked at the extracts in the book, this is a very taciturn diary. So you have to interpret it and read it in a very different way than if you were sitting down and reading a 19th or 20th century diary where people are very expressive about their feelings. So what I looked for were patterns. What were the patterns in this diary? What did she leave out? And what did she include? And the secondary literature and the medical literature from this era focused on emergencies, mm -hmm. it focused on crises in childbirth. And the secondary literature was very, very interested in something that was important in the 20th century, which is interventionist <clears throat> versus so called natural delivery. Um, I had, uh, I have five children. I sort of lived through that transition from a period when my first child was born in 1960, when the pattern was sort of knock you out so you don't experience, you know, any pain or for very progressive women I have a spinal um, which was a big deal, believe me, it was not an epidural. Mm -hmm. uh, so the issue of interventionism and the romantic account of natural childbirth from the late 20th century really influenced the way people wrote about birth. So I really struggled in the chapter in which I really described in great detail um, what I learned from her diary about childbirth. And 
what I learned from the diary was what she didn't say. Yeah. There weren't a lot of deaths, for one thing, which is a great surprise given the traditional view about um, childbirth mortality. And there were some mothers who died, and it was very clear from the context of her other medical work and what I could learn about epidemics in the 18th century. That was infection of some kind, often strep or something else. But what she did care about, basically, were two things. As I began to unpack the sequence of events in a typical delivery, the first issue is, how's she going to get there? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a frontier setting of sorts. I mean, and there's a very large river. Yeah. And she works on both sides of the Kennebec River. Um, and she's called in the middle of the night. So the journey mattered tremendously to her. And some of the most details in these birth stories are about getting there. Yeah. And then it was very, very clear that there was a sequence in the delivery um, and the transition points in her diary were not expressed physiologically. They're expressed socially. Hmm. Who's present or who's not present. Um, and so <clears throat> the attendants, <laughs> the women who come and assist in some way, come and go. The after nurse comes at a certain point when the after nurse is there she leaves the after nurse is somebody that's helping her with the baby and um, it could be um, a relative uh, a mother or someone else or someone who just is you know doing the kind of routine health care um, with the mother and child and and Martha typically leaves. And of course, getting paid is also yeah. a really important thing in the diary. I mean, she keeps a record. Now, that doesn't mean she didn't understand a delivery in physiological terms. It just means it was so common, she didn't need to yeah. write these things down. And it, it, it was uneventful was uneventful. A long labor was eventful. A stillborn child was eventful. Um, and then if you've seen the PBS film based on the book, the most moving delivery by far, I think, was a delivery that took place when the whole family was sick with probably with some kind of strep infection or mm -hmm. scarlet fever and 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 there were um other other children in the household who who were ill and this woman was giving birth and also losing other children mm -hmm. um, to death and that reminded Martha of her own experience, experiences that are not recorded in the diary because the diary hasn't begun yet. They're in her early life when she lived in Massachusetts before she migrated to Maine. And she, her family experienced a diphtheria epidemic where she lost um, children of her own at a time when she herself was pregnant and delivered a child. So that, uh, uh, it took me a long time to figure out what was going on in that diary entry. Yeah. But by putting together patterns of the way she wrote about birth stories and then um, patterns also in the diary where she recalled the births of her own children and the deaths of these little girls that she lost um, 
years before, years before, um, I was able to see that this dramatic moment when she's attending a woman in the midst of an epidemic was at the anniversary of a similar experience that had happened to her wow. years before. And, and that, that was uh, very moving uh, for me as I began to realize what she was saying in the diary. She didn't tell me all that. Yeah. Um, it, it took um, a lot of kind of massaging of the records <laughs> and a lot of sort of um, deep research for me to be able to lift that story out of, out of her um, taciturn diary. Yeah. That's what impressed me so much about A Midwife's Tale is that you so masterfully fill in those details and connect those dots because like you say, the excerpts from her diary are rather taciturn and short and just yeah. detail oriented on just specific comings and goings and payments and those sorts of things. So I really appreciated the story that you crafted around all of that. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that you get into in the book is the changing relationship between doctors and midwives in New England at the beginning of the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Can you just describe for our listeners what were the traditional roles fulfilled by midwives and how did doctors changing roles influence that practice of midwifery? Okay, well, the kind of traditional relationship was actually quite cordial, I think. Um, they didn't want to be doctors were often gentlemen those that had some kind of formal education or had apprenticed with another physician. I mean, they were the ones who did deal with emergencies. They did not primarily handle ordinary deliveries. Might perform autopsies. Mm -hmm. They might come in in an obstructed delivery and use um, forceps as they had developed in the 18th century. They might administer opiates or other things. I might, you know, it could be very gruesome. They sometimes <laughs> dismembered the infant. Mm -hmm. uh, they so. <clears throat> In Maine, they weren't very specialized um, in terms of being a surgeon versus being a, um, a physician, which were two different sorts of medical approaches. But they had some training, not much. And there are deliveries recorded in doctors' account books and um, records from this period, but it's not common for ordinary women to be delivered by a physician. And even for well-to-do women, but it's beginning in this period that um, medicine is beginning to take on more of its later professional um, identity. It, it's, it's kind of a Learned gentlemen's practice um, in uh, communities like Hollowell. But that starts to change um, late in the 1700s, early 1800s. Some people think has a little bit with the expansion of medical training during the American Revolution and with the creation of medical societies, um, a growing kind of self-consciousness about medicine as a, a, you know, a decent occupation. You can mm -hmm. earn a living. You don't have to do it on the side um, as a proprietor of land or something else, mm -hmm. or even as a minister. But an identity as a, a physician is beginning to develop. So Early in the diary, a doctor shows up very rarely. And um, 
usually in some kind of emergency, but not often. But then this new physician moves into town, who's um, Benjamin Page, who's, who's really trying to develop a practice. And, you know, there are a lot of babies being born and uh, they're starting to move into childbirth. And he's a bit of a bungler, um, in my view. And (laughs) certainly, well, in my view, as informed by Martha, because she didn't really think much of him. Mm -hmm. She was very frustrated by him. He didn't defer to her the way Dr. Coney, the older physician, had um, and I think it was a bit more interventionist. You know, she was dismayed when he gave one of the laboring women um, opiates and mm-hmm. in Martha's voice, you know, stopped, stopped the progress of the delivery. Um, but the interesting thing is, After Martha's death, and perhaps even earlier, Benjamin Page became a very successful physician, had a long career in the area, did become uh, quite competent. But um, he, he, midwives were trained by experience, by observing and working alongside other women. And if you only dealt with emergencies, as most physicians did, mm-hmm. you didn't have the experience necessary to really handle um, a conventional delivery. And you probably weren't welcome in the birthing mm-hmm. room. But that began to change. It only changed really um, among elites, uh, it happened first in coastal areas. But as doctors began to create more full-time practice, um, delivering babies was a good addition to your income. Mm -hmm. And the the literature suggests that um, it wasn't necessarily an improvement, um, particularly in this early period when these new physicians lacked much experience, but over time, they were welcomed um, into childbirth, except for very rural places and among immigrants, for example, or in the South. Um, And that transition was just beginning Mm -hmm. in Martha Ballard's lifetime. And the thing that puzzled me is I was unable to determine who might have picked up the practice as she declined and got older. Uh, She was still being called almost to the end of her life, but her practice did decline as she became less able to do the kind of arduous journeys. And I think the... Benjamin Page took up some of that practice. There must have been midwives, but they were in a what became the capital of Maine. It wasn't much of a city, but it was much more developed, and it was very connected to trade and to the coast. And I suspect uh, physicians did pretty much take over the ordinary practice in some of those towns but not all of them. They didn't leave very helpful diaries, it sounds like. No, the diary, I I can't identify a person who I would identify as an apprentice or successor. Now, in contrast, um, I did quite a bit of work um, in in different times, but I dealt with it also in a house full of females, which mm-hmm. is a 1978, 2017 book about early Mormon women. Now, Patty Sessions, the 
Latter-day Saint midwife who went west um, and who was in Missouri and Nauvoo and and delivered uh, many, many uh, early early delivers among Latter-day Saints. She was born about 60 miles from where Martha Ballard lived. She would have been the same age as Martha Ballard's granddaughters. Mm. But she was in a much, uh, in the interior, uh, a much more um, rural setting. And in her own autobiography, she explains that she became a midwife by accompanying her mother-in-law, I think it was, um, to deliveries. And when the old lady just couldn't make it in time, (laughs) she rushed ahead and officiated the, the delivery alone and then eventually became a practitioner and her practice seems a lot like Martha's Hmm. you know it's a different environment but among certain groups and the communities in Utah were part of a different kind of transformation in rural America in the 19th century, which is a real pushback against physicians at at all levels with a much more kind of herbal community-based medicine. And Patty's Sessions really fits into that pattern very much. So it, it was sort of a resurgence of the old herbal-based, community-based healthcare system. Not the same, but in its uh, social practices, uh, very, very similar. Interesting. So to tie all this together, you've talked about Patty Sessions, Martha Ballard, You've given birth five times. You've watched children and grandchildren and been parts of lots of communities throughout your life. So as a historian and a mother and a community member, what insights do you have about how cultural norms and medical practices influence the way people typically give birth and their expectations about the experience? Uh... You know, it's um, this is a really complex question. It is. <laughs> uh, an extremely complex question because it changes over time and it's culturally constructed as well. Right. Um, in in um, early America in the 17th century, um, which is where I I began as a historian. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, the famous poem of Anne Bradstreet, who was an early immigrant to Boston in the 1630s. Um, She has a poem called A Letter to My Children, um, in which she's about ready to to go into labor with another child. And, you know, it's kind of, uh, I think, I I don't have the exact title in front of me, but essentially it's a kind of says to her husband, don't, uh, don't, you know, if I should die, please don't let a stepmother abuse them. You know, it's that kind of, and it's very much in these early American sermons, this sense of impending death. Mm. Um, It's a a crisis um, and a spiritual crisis. (laughs) And I think it, it also becomes deeply entangled with the sense of theology that woman is being experiencing the original sin through the pain of childbirth. It's there in the Bible. And the, the 
dominant line coming from religious writers from New England who write about childbirth is, you know, trust Christ, trust God, trust the prophecy that by relying on God you will prevail. But don't complain if the baby, you know, don't despair if the baby dies. Everything is God's will. Put your hands into the hands of God. And and I found um, similar themes. Um, the line that I love that I found in letters and in different very skimpy little uh, transitory diaries or entries for birth is um, the Lord was better to me than my fears. <laughs> you know, I prevailed. I got through this. Um, and women did die in childbirth. I mean, I think there's a lot of surprise how come Martha Ballard's numbers were so good? Yeah. Well, it made a huge difference if you were healthy, well nourished, you had plenty to eat, mm -hmm. you had a strong body, and you're young, <laughs> you know. Actually, I think that the historical literature and in the in the <clears throat> sort of medical analysis of historical childbirth, it, it if you get through the first birth, you often can do pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, but um, how often do you give birth? You know how that women breastfed, so they were spaced. They weren't. The, the, they were their bodies were stressed pretty much from first birth until menopause. They're either pregnant or nursing. But Martha's clients had enough to eat, mm -hmm. and they were young. Um, you know, it was a new developing society, and so I think she was skilled. But I, I, I think these other factors were extremely important and I think there were way more deaths among um in, in Patty Sessions world and in part because they were refugees, you know, they often didn't have enough to eat and then epidemic disease and uh, cholera and uh poor nutrition in that very early period. And, and that's one reason that in the Latter-day Saints story, the Women's Relief Society in the early 1870s is saying, you know, we need better training. Mm -hmm. And so they send women, interestingly enough, to Philadelphia, um, where I now live, yeah. but Philadelphia Women's Medical College was training lots of uh, women who lived in places where there were pretty high risks. Um, they trained people who were going to be missionaries in different parts of the world. And they trained a handful of women from Utah, um, they trained some American Indian women. Um, it's it's uh, and it was important. And so I've I if we go later, if we go into the 1870s with somebody like Ella Ship, I've read um, her thesis, for example, at the Women's Medical College. I wow. mean, you would think what? <laughs> this is a thesis. This is medical school, you know. <laughs> but but she got a lot of clinical practice um, there, and she learned a lot. And she learned, you know, it was the beginning of really more 
attention to the whole body and nutrition and all of these things. Um, and she, uh, she went home and helped to train midwives and, and nurses and people who were involved in uh, birthing centers, essentially, that were created in um, rural settings in Utah and Idaho and Arizona and various places. Wow. There's a lot of history there. Yeah. Yeah. And I love just listening to you. I know from our conversation, you could go on and on for hours, just telling us about the things that you've learned and researched and studied. Um, I appreciate the time you've taken today, though, to tell us a little bit and direct the listeners towards A Midwife's Tale and House Full of Females if they want to learn more. And I thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's always fun to talk. If you're interested in sharing your ideas or experiences on the podcast, go to birthwords.com. If you're liking what you hear, please leave a review on your podcast app. For more resources about language for a better birth, Subscribe to the monthly newsletter at birthwords.com and follow Birthwords on Instagram and Facebook.